Okay. So, um, I know that I had said uh, I was originally going to uh, post uh, a makeup lecture over the weekend, but then after looking at <clears throat> the days we had left, uh, I decided that uh, we're still on track to cover everything, so uh, one's not really needed, although I do reserve the right to uh, post a supplemental lecture at some point in the future if I feel like I need uh, to make up some time. Okay, so that's uh, that's one thing that might happen, but obviously I would let you know uh, uh, in case uh, that happens and uh, I'm not going to pile it all on you at once or anything. So, um, <clears throat> last time uh, we had shown that the cross ratio is the fundamental invariant of uh, four points on a projective line, uh, meaning that any other uh, invariant of four points on a projective line um, is a function of cross ratio, right? So basically it's the only one, right? Now, uh, it doesn't mean exactly that, but of course uh, it means it's, it's very close to being the only one, right? Mm. Okay, so um, tidying up some of these ideas, uh, there's this, um, <clears throat> of course, our examples of projective uh, geometry. So it's a little strange because we talked more about the projective plane um, earlier on. Uh, and then later we talked about the projective line and talked about cross ratios and all that. Um, <clears throat> so that's a little strange because, um, you know, talking about uh, uh, this, it, it's almost like we did it in reverse because we, we talked about the higher dimensional object first. Right, so it seemed a little weird. Um, but <coughs> there's a reason for that, and that's because we came uh, from <laughs> studying, you know, the plane, Euclidean plane. That was clearly the most important object for us, and so we immediately wanted to come across the, the object that was the analog uh, of that for projective geometry, which is RP2. Right, and so um, RP2, the real projective plane, of course, is the most important example. Um, it's the most commonly used example, but it's, of course, not the only one. Um, <clears throat> we saw that uh, we could similarly define the complex projective plane, CP2, right? Uh, and we did this by uh, noting the following. So, I mean, what is, <clears throat> what is RP2, right? Using homogeneous coordinates, then a point, right, in RP2 uh, is given by this triple of points, of course, you know, any triple, it's scalar multiple of, of this uh, works just as well. These are homogeneous coordinates. Um, and this gives rise to linear equation. These are lines, right, through the origin in R3. Okay. But of course, um, Note, I've intentionally not said where x, y, and z live here. And so whether x, y, and z are real numbers, or whether x, y, and z are complex numbers, right, doesn't really matter. Okay, so mm, I, mar I marked that out too, too well. So let's take real numbers and put like a, just a slash mark through it right here. <coughs> okay. So, um, if x, y, and z are reals, well, that's one thing. We get RP2. Uh, of course, if we allow uh, all these things involved to be complex numbers instead, uh, we get CP2, okay, which is a different thing, but it's still a projective plane. That is, uh, if you remember correctly, uh, this means if we go back to that list of projective plane axioms, uh, those are satisfied by CP2. Uh, we're definitely not saying these things are like, equal in some way they're not but they are both models of a projective plane <clears throat> but there's going to be things that are true in rp2 that are not true about cp2 um all right so um similarly uh we could actually replace c with any field f okay so with any field so what is a field F. Okay, well, <clears throat> a field F 
so F is a field. Uh, it means it's a set uh, together with two binary operations. It's got plus and it's got multiplication, which, mm, okay, I'll write it as a, as a cross like the textbook does. So it's got two <clears throat> binary operations. And these uh, satisfy the field axioms. Okay, so you're familiar with these. In fact, uh, when it comes to, um, we talked about this at our discussion of uh, when we were doing linear algebra, um, if we wanted to mimic Hilbert's uh, axioms for Euclidean geometry <laughs> using linear algebra, um, what this what we came across um, was uh, we needed all the, the vector space axioms together with, we needed the dot product and the properties of the dot product. And then we needed the field axioms because the field axioms were the axioms satisfied by where we picked our scalars. Okay, so our scalars lived in a field. Um, and even though we talked about, you know, real vector spaces, uh, we didn't need to do that. Uh, we could have just as well have talked about complex vector spaces or generic vector spaces uh, where the scalars are just in uh, a field, um, as we're talking about now. Okay, so satisfy the field axioms. I'm not going to go through all those because we mentioned those uh, back in Chapter 4. Okay, so uh, if F is any field, um, we can consider... Uh, F3, <clears throat> the uh, space of triples, say uh, XYZ with uh, X, Y, and Z all in my field F. Okay. And thus we can define homogeneous coordinates, right? We have a notion of multiplying in a field. We have notions of adding uh, in a field. Can actually define homogeneous coordinates, uh, and using that, of course, we can define uh, FP2, where F is any field. Okay. So what is FP2 here? <coughs> so this is a projective plane. So projective plane over the field F. <clears throat> uh, so how do I define this? Well, uh, if I have a projective plane, all I need to define are what are my points and what are my lines. Uh, and I need to define that in such a way that it satisfies uh, those axioms I care about. So the first thing uh, is uh, this has, so FP2 has points. So what are those points? So each of which uh, is a set of triples, kx, ky, kz, okay, where x, y, z uh, are all in f. All right, so these are my homogeneous coordinates, right? And these are fixed, and my scalar k runs through all the elements of f. Okay, so that's nice. Okay. <clears throat> And secondly, um, it has lines. What are its lines? So it's lines, uh, each of which consists of the points each of which consists of the points satisfying an equation of the form uh, AX plus BY 
plus CZ equals zero for some uh, A, B, C in my field. Okay. So this might seem uh, maybe on the surface not as interesting, um, <coughs> but what is it that I'm saying here? Um, well, I am really not doing anything special here. I'm just mimicking. Uh, I'm just mimicking the construction that I use for um, for RP2 here, right? Constructing homogeneous coordinates for the points, defining the lines in the same uh, in the same way. Um, so we can check. Uh, I'm not going to do that, uh, but we can check that uh, FP2 satisfies. The projected plane axioms. <coughs> okay. Um, it actually breaks down exactly like the ones for RP2 does. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, we can do this construction. This is the important part. We can do this construction. for any field. Now, on its face, maybe you're not too impressed with that because right now, your examples of any field are the reals and the complex numbers. Um, but if you have a little bit of background in algebra, <clears throat> um, there are a number of fields that you can talk about and some give rise to some really, really uh, interesting geometries here. So, um, for instance, let uh, F be the rationals. <clears throat> All right, Q. So let uh, F, the field we're talking about, be Q. In that case, the space we get is uh, the projective plane QP2. Now, um, this is a little funny, and you might, uh, you might intuitively know what's going to happen here. So Q is a field. Um, it's a field. But the reason why the rationals don't get, you know, the same kind of cred uh, that the reals of complex numbers get is because for the rationals, there's holes everywhere. Right? We know of the existence of irrational numbers. Um, and so, you know, especially if you've had 410, right, this is a key. This is like the reason why 410 is done the way it is, is because the rationals have holes in them, right? This is the reason why we need the reals. Um, and so, uh, there's holes everywhere. There's gaps everywhere. And so, this is basically like RP2 with, with holes, right? So basically, uh, it's RP2 with gaps everywhere. Okay. So, so it's pretty funny. It's pretty cute to think about, but it's uh, maybe not super duper interesting. Um, okay. Um, what, is a, what is another option? So it turns out... Remember, I said we can do this for any field. All right, well, it turns out um, there are finite fields. So if you haven't uh, seen an example of this, uh, then um, you, know, you will in uh, your first serious course in algebra. Uh, so it turns out um, we can also do this for finite fields. And I mean, I shouldn't say it turns out. I'd did this construction for any field, it didn't matter whether it was finite or not. And it turns out we can also do this for finite fields. Okay. So we can also do this for finite fields. Hmm. Okay. Now, uh, some facts. Any finite field F one of the one of the nicest and first facts you prove about a finite field when you 
study them uh, in algebra, is that uh, it's not a totally free choice of how many elements they're allowed to have. Um, in fact, you are very, very restricted um, into how many elements uh, these things can have. So, uh, so there's very little freedom here, in a sense. So any finite field F has P to the N elements, where uh, N <coughs> is an integer that's bigger than or equal to 1, and P is prime. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say facts. I should say fact. But this is... Uh, this is an important uh, early, early fact that you learn uh, about this. And so, uh, simplest example, don't hit me with some meme about a field with one element. You can Wikipedia that if you want to, but I'm not going to mention it. Uh, so simplest possible field, uh, it turns out the simplest possible field um, has at least two elements. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So uh, the reason for that is, as part of the field axioms, you must have two elements that are defined or their properties are defined relative to those operations. So you need a zero and you need a one, right? You need an additive identity and you need a multiplicative identity, okay? So simplest possible field is uh, F2, okay? So uh, in F2, there are two members, 0 and 1. We'll use the symbols 0 and 1 here. Um, but to see what goes on in this field, of course, you have to define um, their plus and their multiplication tables. Okay. <coughs> so um, for the field F2, it's not too bad. So uh, what? how do I add two elements. Well, there's only two elements. There's 0 and 1. Right? And there's 0 and 1. So 0 plus 0, that must be 0 by the field axioms. And 0 plus 1 has to be... Uh, so 0 plus 1 has to be 1 by the field axioms. And 1 plus 0 has to be 1 by the field axioms. So these are actually determined... If we want the field axioms to be true, though, this has to be the case. Okay? Now, if we want this to make sense and have all the nice properties that we want. It turns out, in order for this to be a field, what does 1 plus 1 have to be? Uh, it turns out 1 plus 1 needs to be 0 for this to all work out nicely. Okay. I mean, there's only two options here, right? It's either 0 or it's 1. Uh, consider the algebraic ramifications if I had put a 1 there instead of a 0. Okay. Uh, and then we have multiplication table, which is easy for us here. Uh, again, um, so 0 times 0, well, okay, I know that's 0. 1 times 0 is, that's got to be 0. And, or sorry, 0 times 1. And 1 times 0 has got to be 0. And 1 times 1 is 1. Okay, that's easy. Okay. Um, and so this uh, projective plane, uh, F2P2, uh, has 7 points. Okay, and I know that it has seven points just counting these combinations here. So uh, remember, I'm using homogeneous coordinates here, but we only have two, for any given coordinate slot, I only have two options, right? Zero or one. And so um, this is one, zero, zero, uh, zero, one, zero, uh, zero, zero, one, uh, zero, one, one. Uh, 1, 0, 1, uh, 1, 1, 0, and then one more, which is just 1, 1, 1. Okay, so it's got seven points like that. Um, and uh, these can be arranged along seven lines. Okay, um, and I'm going to, rather than draw this, um, and in fact, let's, here, I'm going to uh, 
list out what the lines are. So the lines, again, it's easy to go through every possible combination here. So I get, you know, these coordinate lines and then uh, X plus Y is zero. Uh, y plus Z is zero uh, and Z plus X is zero. Uh, so that's six. One more is uh, X plus Y plus Z is zero. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now I am going to uh, show you a picture of this. Now this picture is uh, this picture is really to kind of tie in uh, spiritually what this thing is. Um, so this is done in a way just to keep the beauty and symmetry. It's not like it didn't have to be drawn this way. Uh, it's literally just drawn this way uh, for convenience sake to see how all this all works. So uh, here's all my lines to show you. Uh, this circle is a line, right? This circle is a line that connects those three points indicated. Uh, and that circle is actually the line x plus y plus z equals zero. Okay, and so this is what I'm looking at. This is the simplest possible projective plane. Okay, so this is the smallest possible projective plane. Well, this is the smallest possible projective plane called the Fano plane. Okay. All right. So this um, is a weird object, right, from our perspective, because uh, it's an example of finite geometry, all right, which is something that we have not mentioned, and something that is kind of sort of very own its or very much its own subject. Uh, it's also a subject I actually don't know uh, a huge deal uh, about because it's um, it kind of goes in a very different direction um, from a lot of other uh, geometry. But there's uh, a lot of stuff about the Fano plane. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that. This is a very um, <clears throat> this is a very uh, interesting uh, example of finite geometry coming up, and this is. Um, this is kind of the most natural way to introduce that, so that's why I wanted to talk about this uh, now. And so, um, <coughs> basically, because we're dealing with fields here, uh, linear algebra works just fine. So all the stuff that we did in chapters three and four works um, perfectly fine. Um, and uh, the thing is um, that uh, uh, finite talking about finite geometry and finite projective uh, geometry is a little, we're not going to go down that road, uh, at all because it turns out that, you know, things can get really, uh, kind of nasty and take us in a place that's, it's not going to be convenient for the rest of what we're going to do. But anyway, I just wanted to introduce, um, that. So one more thing before finally moving on to chapter six that I wanted to mention, uh, is the cross ratio again. So, um, we, of course, defined the cross ratio uh, on a real projective line. Um, but it turns out that <coughs> we needn't restrict ourselves uh, in that way. So um, we can also uh, generalize the cross ratio to uh, an invariant of a projective line FP1 uh, obtained from a field F. Okay, and so uh, how do I do this? So replace uh, R with uh, any field F. Okay, uh, in our discussion, in our earlier discussion of um, fractional linear transformations. <coughs> okay. So replace R with any, uh, field F in this earlier discussion, uh, that we mentioned. Okay. 
Um, and thus, uh, what is this? So the uh, transformations that uh, say send x to x plus l, uh, x to kx, these both make sense in f, right? So these make sense on a field or in a field f. Um, because we have plus in a field and we have multiplication in a field, right? Well, um, x getting sent to 1 over x makes sense, uh, except for the possible two points going forward and backward, right, involving 0 and infinity. Uh, so it makes sense on f union a point at infinity, Right. Remember that uh, intuitively we like to think about this as being the infinity we're used to, uh, but in this more general setting, of course, it's clear that it doesn't need to literally be that. It can just be any point that's not on um, this line, right? If you think about this line being that's representing your field F, uh, this point. Uh, at infinity is just uh, some point that's not on it. Okay. So this makes sense on um, this extended field if we set... Uh, um, so if we set 1 over 0 to be equal to infinity and 1 over infinity to be equal to 0. Right? So exactly the same thing we did before. All right. Then... Uh, the transformation that, of course, is a combination of these things. Um, algebraically, we can show that any such thing is necessarily a combination using the exact same algebra because it only required us using the field axioms once all this made sense. Um, where A, B, C, and D are in F, uh, and A, D minus B, C is not equal to zero, um, this makes sense on uh, FP1, which is exactly what you think it is, All right? So uh, FP1 is defined in the, the analogous way that we defined RP1, which was uh, it's my extended field, right? It's F union um, <coughs> infinity. Uh, the cross ratio is invariant in this setting. So cross ratio is uh, invariant in this setting. In fact, it has all the same uh, properties uh, because algebraically the reason why those things were true uh, still hold in this more general setting. Okay, one more thing. One, one more thing um, that is not mentioned in the textbook um, because this is some like brand new stuff. Uh, as I joked when we first started talking about the cross ratio, um, a subtitle for the cross ratio could be like why I have a PhD uh, because the cross ratio was, or I should say a generalized notion of cross ratio was like the central uh, quantity that was extremely important for me uh, when I was doing research on this stuff. And so um, there are generalized cross ratios. And I'm just going to mention them. <coughs> Unfortunately, it would take way too long to get into it here because this is stuff that has only been done in like the last 20 years. Um, so what is the idea here? Our cross ratio is an invariant of a, pro, uh, a projective line, right? And so uh, in particular, I mean, the main example is uh, we considered cross ratio of four points on RP1, right? Okay. <coughs> so um, now what, uh, in what way do we want to generate? We just saw how we had a generalization in the sense that, oh, instead of defining it on RP1, we defined it on FP1, right? So um, we could actually use any field there. 
and define it on FP1. Uh, that's that's one example. But here I'm more interested in defining it in a setting where instead of doing it for RP1, I want to come up with a way of defining a cross ratio like thing when my space is something like RP2 or RP3. Now it turns out that uh, doing this, coming up with a way of doing this, is extremely hard and took a ton of machinery to come up with something that properly um, generalizes it. So I'm not going to get into any of that. And honestly, off the top of my head, I, I couldn't even do it. This is, this is the result of, you know, papers that, you know, the collective sum of these papers is hundreds of pages long. Um, you know, written by a very, very good mathematician. So, like, this is this is not something that could be uh, just recited, um, except giving, like, you know, the, the important points. And so, what the important points are uh, is that, like, why is this so important? The cross ratio, as we saw, has so many. We went through an entire list of properties that the cross ratio had. And those properties were extremely nice. Um, so here's kind of a math philosophy type thing going on. Um, it turns out that really the reason why the cross ratio is so nice has to do with its algebraic properties. It's, or I should say is, it is very intimately tied with its formal properties. Okay. And so what I mean by that is, um, its formal properties uh, are just algebraically the form that it takes. Um, and why this is important is, uh, for instance, just to kind of give you an example. Um, specifically, the thing I'm talking about is uh, what I ended up showing in my dissertation was a generalization of a fact that my advisor had shown back in the 80s. Um, and it turned out that one of the, like, one of the lemmas, one of the nice computational things uh, that made those computations back in the 80s possible came from the fact that certain transformations of cross ratio are just really, really nice. And the cross ratio behaves in this really, really nice way so that just everything you need cancels out perfectly. Okay. Namely, if you apply transformation to points and then compute a derivative relative to some parameter okay, of the cross ratio... Taking a derivative of a cross ratio satisfies an extremely nice uh, formula. Um, but the thing is that proving this formula has almost nothing to do with the cross ratio itself and has to do only with basically the algebraic properties of the cross ratio. Meaning that if you could find a generalization of the cross ratio that had the exact same algebraic properties that it does, um, the argument in the old case basically carries through identically. Uh, you basically don't even need to change anything. Uh, so then all the difficulty comes in actually constructing this generalized cross ratio. Anyway, so this is just an example I thought it was worth going into. Okay. Now, um, what, is <coughs> what is the idea uh, here? Um, so the idea going forward the idea I capitalize it we're still in our third pillar we're still in projective geometry so we're looking we're looking at projective planes okay what is it that I'm wanting to do here um, <clears throat> so before that is in chapter three, especially, but I'll say chapter three and four just because that those were the pair that went together with that pillar. So before in chapter three and four, we uh, discussed coordinates, <coughs> right? And coordinates were extremely nice. They allowed us to I mean, they allowed us to describe, they allowed us to do a bunch of proofs in a way easier uh, form. Um, they allowed us to talk about a lot of stuff. They even allowed us to talk about 
uh, these projective models like RP2, right? We define using homogeneous coordinates, which we came about through putting coordinates on R3, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, so before we discussed uh, coordinates, uh, we brought these in. from outside what does that mean um, well what it means is that <clears throat> we had the plane in front of us right and someone had to tell us about coordinates and we like imposed the coordinates on the plane right so we did the labeling right and in fact we know that <clears throat> someone had to do this because the ancient Greeks didn't use coordinates, right? I mean, coordinates didn't become a thing until Descartes, you know, used them basically in the 1500s. Uh, coordinates just didn't exist. Uh, and so they were brought in from outside, okay? Um, it turns out, though, we don't have to do this. This is an amazing fact that there is actually a way of constructing coordinates purely from the geometry itself. Okay, and even better, <coughs> I don't need Euclidean geometry to do it. I only need projective geometry to do it. I.e., we can define coordinates so we can define coordinates um, purely by geometric means. Okay. Also, we only need projective geometry to do this. Okay, so these are two very important facts. I'm going to box them separately. So we can define coordinates purely by geometric means. And also, we only need projective geometry to do this. So why is this particularly nice? Well, um, projective geometry is simpler than Euclidean geometry, right? Just in a strict sense, um, Euclidean geometry had a list of a ton of axioms. Uh, you know, if we're if we're making it 100% rigorous, if we're using Hilbert's axioms, had a list of you know like 20 or like 19 axioms or something, um, and uh, um, you know consisted of compass and straight edge constructions. But um, I mean, projective plane had like very few axioms, right? Only had a, a handful, and it only consisted of straight edge constructions, right? So it's definitely simpler the Euclidean geometry in that sense. And so it turns out that um, the geometry we need to define coordinates is actually even more primitive than Euclidean geometry. So this is basically something we can do uh, in almost any geometric setting. Okay, that's kind of uh, the point. Now, <coughs> it turns out um, that uh, Doing it in complete generality for projective planes is not going to be something that we can do. So, um, however, some of the projective planes, right? So we know that there's a bunch of examples, projective planes. So some of the projective planes um, have no reasonable system of coordinates. Okay. Now, you might say, hmm, well then this box thing that I wrote here wasn't quite true. Um, so, uh, it's not that I only need projective geometry to do it. Maybe there's something else here that I need. And it turns out, yes, there's something else I need here. It's additional properties that we had in our previous examples. Okay, so uh, we need additional axioms. Um, so it turns out what we need 
are we need the Pappas theorem and de Zarg's theorem. <coughs> These are the things we need. Okay. Now, I had mentioned this before, way back, um, the importance of, of these. Um, and it turns out that in our arithmetization of, uh, in our arithmetization of geometry, the Pappas theorem is the thing that corresponds to commutative multiplication. And uh, the de Zarg's theorem corresponds to associativity. Okay. All right. Anyway, so I think now is a good time to stop before I get into this. So next time, um, continue on into Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is, especially the earlier sections, they're pretty long-winded, and they're kind of best shown with a sequence of diagrams rather than me actually writing out a bunch of, um, of these arguments you know, line by line. And so um, on Wednesday, uh, we'll start um, doing that. So uh, I'll post an announcement later today about uh, a roadmap for the course uh, going forward. Um, your exams will hopefully be graded soon. I wanted them to be graded. Uh, I wanted all your grading to be done a little bit faster, but uh, some stuff has come up. But I'll, I'll, send, out a, I'll send out an announcement um, later, either today or tomorrow, uh, addressing that stuff. So right now you don't have anything going on. Uh, there will be homework uh, soon, and I'll have some, some office hours corresponding to that. But anyway, um, so I will see you all on Wednesday.